I'm here to talk about a lot of things, actually. Um, primarily art therapy. And you know, something happens when we make art. A lot of things happen when we make art. And when we look at the artwork that we make, we see and have the potential to see what I like to say, multi-dimensional levels of symbol and imagery. To highlight this, I'll tell a quick story of a 28-year-old combat veteran that was engaged in an eight-week art therapy, mindfulness-based art therapy group that was prepared for veterans that had a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. And around the middle of the group, around the fourth week, I prepared a series of two tasks. The first was a watercolor wash. I was looking to learn more about the participants' uh, capacities for self-expression and sense of control. And Kevin here is working and Basically, a watercolor wash is you cover a piece of paper with water and you move the paint around. And as you can imagine, especially if you're not comfortable with watercolor, it's very difficult to make a discernible form. So he's working and he starts muttering under his breath and he's cursing. And, and another group member is like, what is going on over there? And he looks up and he smiles and he says, nothing, everything's fine. And she mused, really, is that right? Because you're cursing and your ears are bright red. He's like, well, you know, it's really hard for me to move this paint around on this canvas. I'm really frustrated, you know? And it's like, yeah, watercolor is frustrating. And he said, but you know, I'm, I'm doing what I always do. What's that, Kevin? I'm pretending everything's OK when it's not. Hmm. The next task in the same group was to use the same materials. And I asked the group to create a symbol for themselves. And as I mentioned, symbols are ways of showing what's not there. Okay, symbol formation is an integration, a combination of both conscious and unconscious material. And Kevin makes what he called the heart of darkness. And as he's explaining what this heart of darkness was to the group, he said, you know, but my heart of darkness, you know, it's there, it's obvious, it's a heart. It's a pretty anatomically correct heart, if I might add. And there was a nurse in the group, yeah, yeah. And he said, but you know, my heart doesn't have those things on it. And she said, what? You mean arteries? Yeah, my heart doesn't have those arteries on it. Well, why not? Because I'm completely disconnected. And so the group was able to witness this man pretty quickly explain himself and his feelings in response to what it is that he made. And we use the image to help us explain things that we don't typically have words for. And to illuminate that, I'll ask you if you're comfortable quickly to just close your eyes. And I say, water. Open your eyes. What's something you saw? Waterfall. Something else? An ocean. OK. It's very rare for us to see the word water. Because our brains think in images, and innately we call upon a range of sensory experiences that create an internal world of imagery. And with this imagery, we are often propelled to put that world outside. And we've been doing this since the beginning of time to make our mark, say who we are, where we've been, tell a narrative. And we use the image and the symbol to articulate ambiguous concepts such as disease and pain. And pain is a very difficult thing to talk about. And if you consider that the majority of mental illnesses emerge because of a history of trauma, and if you understand and science understands that trauma is housed in parts of the brain that we don't have a verbal access to, then you can imagine how difficult it can be to talk about things that are painful. Art therapy is a master's level medical and healthcare profession that requires a graduate degree in art therapy to practice. And we've been around since the 1940s. Yet we are challenged, tasked with being able to generate data that is include, well, I don't know why that keeps happening, data that is probably I'm moving too much, data that's inclusive of generalizability, right? It's difficult to 
conduct randomized controlled trials with thousands of people when one of the most important things in art therapy is maintaining the integrity of the subjective creative process. However, quantitative data is imperative and crucial in our healthcare society, as is phenomenological qualitative data, understanding a person's lived experience. And if you're doing any kind of treatment, you're going to invite the understanding of a belief system and a spirituality that becomes integral in a person's recovery and healing path. So what makes us so special, the profession of art therapy, is also what makes us so difficult to define, and that is the art part. Through scientific rigor, through what I I'm identifying as the field of neuroaesthetics. We are offered a different type of lens within which to think about, to research, and to study what it is that we do as clinicians and researchers. Neuroaesthetics is an emerging discipline that is housed in the theorem that properties of the world are systematically related to properties of the mind. Essentially, what we create on the outside is a representation of what's going on on the inside. And neuroaesthetics studies with scientific rigor the brain processes that are involved when we see beauty, art, music. And how do we understand these functions and processes, and how does that inform our perception. And through a neuroaesthetic lens, we are going to come closer to putting the neuroscience basis and foundation underneath and supporting the tenets of art therapy. The first of which, the most important, is that the process of making art and the products that occur all take place within the context of the therapeutic relationship. No matter what kind of psychotherapy you practice, it's the relationship that's the healing component. There are three parties in art therapy. There's the client, there's the therapist, and there's the artwork itself. And so if we take a neuroaesthetic lens, and if we are able to understand with more certainty perceptual systems that take place through mutual engagement, then we're going to understand how to apply that and push forward the evidence for art therapy. We're going to understand with more certainty how visual information processing is affected by both healthy and disease states. For example, spatial representation that occurs with an Alzheimer's disease. We're going to be able to articulate more clearly what we see very often, which is a rejuvenated capacity for people that have endured a brain injury to find a different type of imaginative expression in their artwork or find a talent that they never knew existed. The second tenet of art therapy, the processes of creativity are healing and life enhancing. And creativity is all over the brain. And cognitive neuroscientist Arna Dietrich says that it's Sisyphus's work to try to identify and define the mechanistic properties of creativity. However, what we see in art therapy is we see people feel better. We see people able to talk more fluently when they're making art. Why is this? We see a decrease in physiological symptoms such as stress that we're starting to be able to measure with cortisol studies and things like that. However, if we're able to offer to the neuroscience community that we pay attention to behavior dimensionality and personality patterns as they apply to these processes of creativity. How might we be able to form more of a, a simultaneous and reciprocal relationship with the labs that are studying these very things? The materials and methods that we use in art therapy affect self-expression, they assist in emotional regulation, and they are applied in specialized ways. Kevin was offered Sharpie markers in between these two tasks. As a therapist, I say, hey, you need some more control. I saw his anxiety going up. He politely pushed those markers away. And in the process of doing so, he learned how to use less, he didn't ask for help. He learned how to use less water, he learned to have mastery over the paint 
which might not sound like a big deal, but for a man that's dealing with the post-traumatic stress and traumatic memories on a daily basis and having to walk around like everything's fine when it's not, it's huge. He leaves the group with a sense of agency and a stronger sense of self, and perhaps most importantly, a power and a motivation to move forward. A problem with understanding art therapy process and product is that we do not create art in an fMRI tube or an MRI tube, right? We move around. Something that can help us with this is this revitalized technology, contemporary neuroimaging called mobile brain body imaging, developed at the Schwartz Center for Computational Neuroscience by Dr. Klaus Kramen and Scott Making, and his team that put together this potential of looking at technology in real world environments. And what this means is that a combination of different types of EEG and FNIRS technology can track brainwave activity as we are moving. We can understand so much more about the brain. In fact, we have to understand more about the brain when we're moving in real world environments, as Pepe had mentioned before. So this kind of embodied cognition is very important to understand how the brain operates. We might be able to use this technology to learn more about how different types of media elicit different types of sensory and kinesthetic responses. And should we take our clinic to the lab, we might be able to understand more about effective cognition, which, woo, trying to understand emotions through EEG and brain-computer interface is a whole different ball game. It's a pretty sticky situation, right? But we could get a little bit closer through this technology and through our collaboration. One step closer that we got at IU Neuroscience Center under the leadership of Dr. Bob Pascuzzi, the chair of neurology for the IU School of Medicine, we conducted a study looking at EEG cortical activation patterns to try to understand and tease out some of the distinctions that happen between when you draw versus when you just flip a coin, a rote motor movement, trying to put some kind of evidence, some more evidence underneath what we we know, which is something different is happening when we're making art than when we just move. Another project we're still working on is the use of a brain-computer interface for people that have limited mobility, such as people that have a myotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, which if shockingly we have a dearth of information about and treatment options in terms of existential, psychological, and emotional issues. And so what we do here is we create technology that picks up on physiological data that informs self-expression and offers not only a tool for people to communicate, but also to connect with one another. And so if we move, when we move, we're moving out of the studio, out of the museum, out of the lab, and together, we can address what are becoming overwhelming crises in our current society to improve patient outcomes with the amelioration of disease. And in doing so, we are going to forward knowledge, we are going to create lasting impact and present a revitalized hope for our future all which is within our reach. Thank you.